I just wanted to say a few more things regarding methodology. I will try to keep myself short because I have maximum 10 minutes of time on YouTube. So one thing that I was inviting you to do is to pay attention in uh, when you use a camera, when you use a photographic camera in particular, which is what we're discussing now uh, for field working. So you have to pay attention to the, the, the various subjectivities and intentionalities involved in what I called the, the photographic event, right? And this entails taking care of the context, I mean, and, and incorporating a consideration about the context within which photographs are created. And once again, I point out the idea that photographs are created uh, rather than, you know, being a document of something. And we have to incorporate in our analysis also the different notions and ideas and theories of representation, of reality, and eventually of photography as such that are shared and that encounter each other in that act. So my notions of, of what photography stands for as against the notions that my, my interlocutors, the subjects of the photographs, may have. Um, <clears throat> This context, of course, can be uh, also noted down in terms of, of text, you know, and some anthropologists and visual anthropologists would suggest that it's important to add um, an analysis of, um, uh, I mean, a written commentary to our uh, photographic material, right? So we actually write how the photographs were taken, you know, we bring the notes about also literally. Um, I mean, textually. Uh, um, when I speak about awareness, here it's a question that we know we can't get away from the fact that we have we exercise when we keep the camera in our hands a certain control upon the upon uh, upon the whole process of photographing and in particular then of editing the photographs and giving them meaning and inserting them in in specific spaces, you know, which can be books uh, or an exhibition, etc. Uh, <clears throat> but once again, our own thought is uh, that this would not make impossible the act of actually working with photographs. Now, one thing, uh, one, one way of actually make raising awareness about what we are doing and of inserting photography into a wider spectrum of both ethical and practical considerations is, for instance, for always making the camera visible, always keeping it visible. Uh, I mean, the uh, disguising the act of photography is simply unacceptable, as we already mentioned, but also the fact that we somehow may naturally uh, insert it as a, as a neutral uh, object is, uh, is quite unsustainable and doesn't really help us in, in raising uh, knowledge about the role that the camera plays in this particular context and in creating this particular relationship. Uh, I was mentioning the case of, of Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead when they used the camera and they used to place it uh, kind of in a, in, a, in a position where people would not really be aware of, you know, not hiding it, but not really raising uh, their consciousness about the presence. You know, this somehow links also to a number of professional photographers who in doing portraits may think that important thing is to actually um, create a sense of naturality. So the less you make people conscious about the presence of the camera, the more natural supposedly they become. Here we act on a different principles altogether. We make the camera visible and we want people to acknowledge the presence of the camera and because the presence of the camera is part of the context within which the photograph is created and we have to include that in our analysis and consideration. This is what McDougall tried doing in the case of film, you know, by constructing a harness with a camera on, on, on his shoulder, right? Uh, even though that was also kind of bringing back the idea that this would somehow at the end become the man with the movie camera, you know, which becomes a kind of a natural uh, consideration. But still, the fact that the camera is there and has to be in a visit visible position allows for starting up creating a photographic event, which we may define as participatory, right? I mean, we may actually include um, other, uh, the subjects of the photographs in the very meaning that we create through them, right? Uh, the camera can be inserted, you know, through various methodologies in a dialogue between me and the subject of the photograph. For instance, I may choose to put the photographs at service of a particular community, you know, feeding them back, giving them back, you know, physically, uh, something that the people involved may actually think is useful for them. 
um, surely one interesting experiment is always to uh, show the images, you know. So we could do this in various phases. If we have to start a field work, we may want to first start by just uh, creating some kind of intimacy. In some cases this is needed, in other cases less, with the subjects of, of, uh, of our research. And <clears throat> when we then start photographing them, we may want to go back with the photographs and discuss it with them, discuss the, the content of the photographs. And you know, as, as, uh, as it happens, as it's been um, declared by, by in a number of writings, by Chris Binney, etc., people may sometimes disagree and say that this picture does not represent me at all, you know, and uh, may want you to change the aesthetics of them and may want you to create an entire different kind of portrait. Uh, and you may have to accept that, you know, and this could be, th this becomes your own way of learning about about what photography means as a participatory event, you know, something which is once again relational rather than being, you know, just a documentation of something which which is out there. To this extent, our interlocutors can actually participate in defining the subject of, of the images that we take, right? And we create the flaw. This is a kind of ethnomethodological uh, approach, you know, whereby when we have produced some kind of material, uh, we may put it back at the center of a table and discuss it with them, and we perhaps may record a conversation on it, or film a conversation on it, or maybe take pictures of how people may actually want to correct details and discuss how these pictures can be can be used. Another way is simply also the 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 the, the handing over of cameras. Very often, this is done in term through disposable cameras to our interlocutors to let them ha take pictures of their own environments in certain cases such as with kids and and uh, people who work in particular conditions where we may not allow the access to this can be extremely creating i just wanted to add a few words to the fact that also when we are unable to create a photograph can be a wonderful way of understanding what photographs mean considerations about the content as well uh, I mean, the relation between form and content, you know, you remember with Chris Wright's article, we discussed how we need to kind of fuse and merge together, you know, aesthetic composition with, with anthropological relevance, as Chris Wright puts it. And the choices we make in terms of angles of black and white and color, etc., they bear a meaning. Um, I was giving you just the example of, of photographs that I've taken uh, in in uh, in Delhi in India at the beginnings of of my work there, where I tried to to reproduce the aesthetics by which we actually portray uh, modernity. We, we portrayed American modernity in the fifties, in particular. You know the skyscrapers from below up, very sharp contrast, black and white, etc. Very kind of material pictures. I did the same. You know, just uh, in the late nineties with Delhi and Bombay producing an exhibition called India Doesn't Exist, you know, what I showed pictures of something that people will not be able to place in India, neither in terms of its form nor its content. I could give you the example also of Stephen Felt, who in his book Sound and Sentiment uh, showed two pictures, you know, this is about shutter speed, you know. Uh, he showed two pictures, you know, one giving a very detailed description of, uh, of an individual during a ritual, and another one being very blurry with a long shutter speed, you know, so the image containing movement, and he m made simply the point that the, the, the blurry picture was actually able to convey a much better sense of the, of the emotional character of that ritual rather than the detailed photograph. In my case in Delhi, I did something similar with some work on, on movement, you know, which I call Delhi movement or Indian movement, I don't even remember exactly, where I simply decided to, to photograph events in uh, taking place in Delhi with colors and very highly saturated colors but you know with a with a long exposure so you know every photograph would contain movement and that movement would actually metaphorize the idea of an India that was changing you know and uh, that was changing at a certain speed you know so and this would be it bye <laughs>